Joining us this morning is Craig Melvin. He is not just a network morning anchor. He is also a writer. He's out with a new book called Pops Learning to Be a Son and a Father. Good morning, sir. Rennie, good morning to you. Good to see you, my friend. Thanks for having me. Nice to be out and about. Um, which has been harder for you to do, to be the son or to be the father? Oh, that is a, that's a good question. Um, you know what? I, I think when I was younger, it was being the son. And now that I have two small children, it's definitely being, uh, being, being the father, um, both providing unique challenges, as, as you know. You know, when I was a teenager especially, I was angry and I developed this resentment toward my dad um, because I just thought he was a bum. I thought he was just a drunk. And, and then as I got older, I, I came to understand addiction for what it is and what addiction does to the body and what it does to the mind and what it does to relationships. Um, and, and when I came to understand it better, I was able uh, to help my father more. And that's, that's a, a lot of what this book's about. But now, as a, as a dad, the, the challenge for me now is, you know, am, am I getting it right? Am I, am, I, am I doing enough? Am I doing too much? Am I teaching the kinds of lessons that fathers should be teaching their children? One thing about the book is you are very transparent in the book. Was that hard for you to just kind of open your life up? It's the most difficult thing I've ever done. And, and, and I'll be honest with you, as I'm sitting here having this conversation, I'm still not certain um, it was the right thing to do, but I, it was something that I, I needed to do. It was cathartic for me. And, and when I finished the book and gave it to my dad to read, I realized it was just as cathartic uh, for him, if not more so. But, um, but no, you know, we don't, especially guys, we don't talk a lot about you know, how we feel and how things in the past have made us feel and the relationships that we have with our dads and our children. Those aren't conversations uh, we typically have. But I, I got to a point in my life, Renee, where I, I had to, I had to forgive my dad. And I, I had to forgive my dad, not for him. I had to forgive him for me. And because what was what had started to happen is all this stuff that had been, you know, pent up inside was starting to manifest itself. Um, so so this book, especially the fact that it was written at the beginning of the pandemic, that's, that's when I started. The book was it was cheaper than therapy uh, during the pandemic. But but my hope, my sincere hope and prayer is that it does some good that. It helps people who are either struggling with addiction, have someone in their, their life who has struggled with addiction or struggling. Um, but it's not just a book about addiction. It's a book about resiliency. Uh, it's a book about forgiveness. And it's also just an, an old fashioned love letter to fatherhood, mm. something that I have become uh, quite passionate about. One thing about your relationship, there were some treasured moments. So I want to ask you about that 1973 Pontiac and the role that it played. Rennie, it, it um, you know, it, for me, it was uh, a symbol of, of my childhood because from, it was one of my earliest memories. I mean, my, my dad bought the car in 1973. It, he's never had a car payment, doesn't have a car payment now. He held on to that car, oh, let's see, if I'm 42, he had that car for 33 years? No, he had the car seven years before I was born, so he had the car for 40 years, ready? <laughs> and, and back then, you know, you know this, there were no computers in the cars, he had an eight track player, <laughs> no seat belts. Um, and, and back then, these were his heavy drinking days, so he would literally drink and drive. Like, he had a, a Budweiser between the seat and a cup, I was in the passenger seat, and if, 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 if he had to slam on brakes real fast, he'd take his hand and he'd like put it in my front of my chest, and, and that was supposed to be enough to keep me from going through the windshield. But, but some of my fondest memories were under the hood of that car. And, and my dad, after working third shift at the post office, there was always something wrong with the Le Mans, and, and me being his trusty sidekick, um, I was always there trying to help him figure out what it was and fix it. Um, what, what's not in the book, because I didn't, I didn't want to pile on my, my dad too much, 
he wasn't a very good mechanic. <laughs> so we would spend a lot of time under the hood and he would still have to take the car to an actual mechanic to fix whatever he thought he had fixed, if, if that makes any sense. And my biggest peeve, my biggest pet peeve back then, it was that I never got promoted. I, I, I'm at six, seven years old, I'm handing him, you know, a Phillips head screwdriver or the flashlight. And here I am at 16 or 17, handing him a Phillips head screwdriver and a flashlight. Like he never thought that I was capable of doing any more than that. So that, that was a, you know, it, it, it really it became quite the source of tension as I got older. Great story. Great story. Hey, what kept you from going down the path that your father took? Rennie, I've, I've always thought um, that you can be motivated by negative examples um, just as much as positive examples. And I, I would contend for a lot of folks um, more so. And that was the case for me. I, I didn't know what I wanted to do for a while or who I wanted to be for a while. Uh, but I would look at my father and the way that he was living his life back then, and I would say, well, I don't want to do that. I, I don't know where I want to go. I don't want to take that road. Um, and and that, was, that, that was a powerful motivator uh, for me. I, it just, and I didn't fully appreciate it when I was younger. I, in fact, I didn't fully appreciate it probably until just a couple of years ago. Um, the, the negative example uh, of motivating me the way that it did. But it's the same reason I've never had a cigarette. You know, my, my dad for a while was like smoking two packs a day. And we grew up in a house where everything smelled like cigarette, cigarette mm. smoke. And so when I went off to college, that was one habit I never developed. I, I, I couldn't stand the stench of it. Um, so that was one, one reason that I, I think I, I ended up taking the other road. The other reason really was my mother. I, the title of the book is Pops. But for, for many of my years, my mom was playing the role of mother and father. Um, she financially, emotionally, mentally, it was my mother uh, who put the family on her back for a number of years and, and carried, carried us. Um, and so part of the book is, is a testament to her and a lot of folks throughout the course of my life that played the role of father, played the role of dad when, when my dad uh, was dealing with his demons. I've got two more questions for you. The first one is this. There are two phrases, why not sure. and don't miss out. How are they important to being a parent? Oh, uh, don't miss out is, is, is paramount because, you know, I... My dad missed a lot. And part of it was, you know, working the third shift at the post office. Uh, and the other part was, was the, the drinking. And he was either drinking or hungover or sleeping. And that kept him away from, from the family. That kept him away from all of our sporting events and contests and, and all those things for years. Um, and as a result, I try not to miss anything. Um, I, I try to be as present as, as, as possible, not just physically present, not just there, but when I am there, not, not always being on this thing, you know, making sure that my kids know that they have my, my full undivided attention. Um, so that's, and your, your first phrase was, was why not? Now, why not uh, means something different to me entirely because that's typically what I hear uh, from my children. I have a seven-year-old and a four-year-old and both of them uh, fancy themselves a budding journalist, I gather, uh, because you know this. I mean, when, I grew, when we grew up, you know, your, your, your mom or your dad, they, they would say something, that's it. Mm -hmm. like, you didn't say, well, why not or why? Like, it, it, and if you did, the answer typically was because I said so. And, and at some point, I guess we all, you know, we all got woke and we all decided that we needed to answer all of our children's questions because that helps develop curiosity, intellectual curiosity. I read that in one of these parent books years ago. So now when the kids ask questions, we try to answer the questions. Well, consequently, when I'm not working, I'm answering questions <laughs> constantly. And I was, before I came down to do this interview with you, I was just upstairs, my daughter having pizza, having pizza for lunch, nothing wrong with that, a little pizza from time to time. Uh, but, and, she, and she said, well, Daddy, I want to have pizza for dinner, too. I said, well, sir, you can't have pizza 
for lunch and dinner. Why not? Because you, you can't. You can't eat pizza, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You just can't. Well, well why? Why not? You know, and, and, and I think what frustrates me sometimes, Rennie, is when, they, when she'll ask why not or my son will ask why not, I don't have a good reason. I oftentimes don't really have a good reason other, other than you just shouldn't. You shouldn't do that. That's it. That's all I had. And, you know, so anyway, that's probably not the answer you were looking for. But. It'll work. I'll finish up with this one. What does Father's Day mean to you? Uh, of the titles that I have, there, there is not one that means more than dad. Um, and, and so every year, um, on, on father's day, I am reminded of, of the two blessings that I have in my life. Um, but it, it's also different for me now because I celebrate my dad on father's day. Uh, and we didn't do that growing up, Vinny. Like we, it's, it's dad was typically sleeping or passed out or just, you know, he, he wasn't a part of the day. Uh, but now I get to call my dad on Father's Day and wish him a happy Father's Day and tell him uh, how much he means to me now. Um, and it's, it's, it's special. Sometimes people, people ask, well, what's the perfect Father's Day? What do you want for Father's Day? And I tell my family every year, I've been a dad for seven years now, I tell them I just want a little peace and quiet, just want to get a nap in, I want to be able to have a cigar, pour myself just a little bit of a nice bourbon and be alone just for a little bit. Mm -hmm. Every year, that's what I ask for. You, do you know how many years I've gotten that, Rennie? Zero. <laughs> Zero. Not one. Because what you what you discover what you discover is Father's Day is actually just like the other 364 days of the year when you have children. It's about your kids. It's not what you want to do. It's what your kids want you to do with them. So. I think this year we're going bowling. I've already been informed that that's my, that's my Father's Day gift because you guessed it, my son loves bowling. Happy well, happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day, my friend. Thank you so much for joining me. Have a great day. You too, Randy. Be well, my friend. Be well.